So I'm uh, Scott Fritchan with Basho, and uh, wanted to talk uh, uh, a bit about um, uh, about uh, adding uh, D-trace probes to the Erlang virtual machine, and some of the reasons why wanting to do that in terms of uh, visibility and whatnot. Um, uh, again, I prepared a much uh, longer talk, and only after the fact looked at the, the schedule and saw 15-minute time slots, and so um, the full amount of slides. Uh, I tweeted about earlier today, so at SL Fritchie, if you're at all curious, you want to see the, the full slide deck. Um, and so that, that appears really well, um, and that didn't work either. So uh, that was supposed to be a mugshot of me for the people in the back room, but that's okay. Um, so I wanted to talk about the visibility problem in a particular case study um, that we had um, with a, a customer uh, uh, using React, uh, and then talk a little bit about the past and present that has actually been a bit of history uh, over many years of trying to get D-Trace probes and D-Trace uh, uh, support into the Erlang virtual machine, uh, what things look like uh, today, and uh, bits about the future. So um, the visibility problem with uh, React, which is uh, uh, in this uh, customer case study, um, it's a messaging application. Uh, the customer has already been uh, mentioned, and many thanks to Voxer for allowing us to make talk in public about, about these things. Um, it's uh, The front end application is a custom, uh, custom app. It's in Java. It, uh, uh, it, uh, it is uh, in Node.js, um, and uh, the back end, uh, which is very stateful, uh, unlike the stateless app, um, is React, uh, and it's in uh, Erlang. So the, the customer is DevOps group, they monitor end-to-end -end SLAs, and uh, for the 9th and 100th percentile, have particular SLA uh, limits. And so um, for the back end, uh, React, uh, in summary, is a highly scalable, highly available <coughs> distributed database, um, and in more generally, in more general terms, a distributed computing platform. Which, in the case of uh, React KV that the customer is using, this uh, distributed computing uh, is very stateful and involves uh, 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 storage uh, in uh, disk and, and local memory on each of the uh, member machines. Uh, so React is the backend database, um, and these uh, percentile uh, alarms uh, they ring very irregularly, once every every day uh, to uh, a couple times a week. And these, these latency alarms should never ring. Uh, that's, that's part of the whole SLA thing, right? It's not reproducible either in Basho's lab. It's not reproducible in a customer's lab. It only happens in production, um, which is kind of a nightmare. Um, and we've already talked about uh, how you, you sort of, every time you learn something new about a particular problem you're investigating, you have to change what data you're gathering, the methodology that you use to, to sort of find the next step in your learning process. So the first uh, method that we used is using the built-in Erlang tracing mechanism. Um, uh, Erlang is a message passing uh, a language where uh, threads uh, communicate by uh, message passing. There is, there, there are no, effectively no uh, shared memory uh, variables. And so you use that same message passing mechanism to implement tracing. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in the moment. But, um, for this first pass, we use the built-in uh, tracing mechanism. There's no code changes to uh, React uh, required at this stage. Um, all of these events are sent to a custom uh, event uh, receiver or consumer, and that formats these sort of on disk. Uh, and then those files are copied to a developer machine and loaded into R, and uh, uh, you try to uh, melt the aluminum in the, in, the, in the laptop case, and then you get the answer. Um, and those answers then say we need to change the, the way we gather our data. So uh, frequently we're, we're still using online <coughs> tracing, but now we have to start making code, uh, code changes to React, sometimes on a daily or even more than once a day uh, basis. Um, we're doing a more custom uh, event receiver and analysis, both online and offline using R. And we have uh, batch of staff uh, doing hot code <laughs> upgrades on customer systems, sometimes multiple times a day. So this effort, is kind of happens in bursts of activity, um, anywhere from one to four times a week for up to half a day at a time. Uh, it's usually a senior developer that is involved uh, in doing this uh, each time. Uh, like I said, um, uh, daily or even more frequently than daily code upgrades happening. And the start to finish for this whole uh, case study was about five weeks. Um, and uh, it just sucks. Uh, we need more. We need more tools. This, I mean, it just you know burns a lot of customer time. It burns a lot of our support time. Uh, and uh, so, uh, in the toolbox for Erlang developers, there are uh, several different profilers uh, available, uh, but they're not suitable for use in production environments. Their overheads are way too high. The memory requirements are way too high. 
Uh, and it's also next to impossible to have a customer ops person using those tools. You need, you need a developer, uh, uh, basically, to, to do them or to give step-by-step -step coaching. If you cut and paste this and give it to an ops person uh, so that they don't have to do any interpretation, they're basically doing sneaker net for, with the cut and paste. Uh, Erlang message tracing, uh, you can, it, it's very easy to create sort of a tsunami of, of, uh, of events uh, that overwhelm uh, the receiver. The receiver uh, uh, or consumer of these uh, uh, tracing events, they are uh, a single Erlang process and therefore can only uh, utilize up, up to one CPU core. And so if the, if, if, uh, the producers overrun the consumer, then you end up with a memory explosion and then, then you have multiple problems. And then also, when dealing with custom code, at some point you're uploading enough, or you're loading enough hot patches into the system while it's running that now the QA people are starting to get nervous. This is no longer the package that we qualified and tested and pre-approved and, and tested for uh, for uh, various auditing purposes and, and all that goop. So um, I wanted to uh, then take a little detour and say, well, what makes Erlang special? How many people have actually used Erlang in anger or toyed with it or know what the hell it is? Um, so one of the things that makes it different is it, it's running in a virtual machine, but it's not the JVM, it's not the, the CLR. Uh, and the reason, a large reason for this is um, that uh, the threads that you know, we're used to dealing with, whether they're operating system threads or green threads, um, these things are, are more than just threads, they're processes. They're actually isolated from each other in the same way that operating system processes in OSX or Linux or, uh, uh, or name your fav favorite Unix are isolated. Um, and so. Um, the virtual machine uh, enforces this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, fault isolation. Um, I already mentioned a little bit about message passing. There is uh, effectively no shared state. Um, and you can do this uh, message passing between processes within the same virtual machine, within, uh, between different virtual machines on the same uh, physical box or uh, 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 virtual, uh, virtual machine in terms of uh, VMware or virtual box or whatever, or across a uh, network off to another box elsewhere. Uh, processes migrate all the time. Uh, Erlang processes or threads, uh, processes I'll call them uh, from now on. They migrate to different, uh, different to different P threads and to different CPUs uh, on a fairly regular basis. I have an example of that. Um, and then also in the Erlang virtual machine allows hot, hot code loading. So for each source code module, you can have two different versions of the code running at the same time and do control updates of, of of when you switch from one version of the code to another. And when you make that transition, you can then change the, the, your uh, state data to sort of do an upgrade uh, to, uh, uh, of, the, of the data or downgrade if the data structure changes. Uh, I have an elevator demo um, that shows a, it's a GUI of an of a elevator controller. The elevators go up and down. You can summon a button to a floor. And then a GUI where you can do, the pro you can do sort of like a chaos monkey and sort of start killing processes and watch what happens to the elevators and, and whatnot. And um, if anyone's interested in seeing that, uh, after the presentation, I, I'm more than happy to show that. Um, so, uh, about the Erlang tracing mechanism, it is really cool, in, in fact, almost awesome, but there's, there's this problem of, of having only one consumer uh, in a system. And then also, um, uh, the function boundaries, you, you, you can get trace events uh, when a function uh, is uh, called and when it returns, so then you, get, you have the possibility of getting the most events if your functions are small and short rather than rather than big, and so sometimes to be able to see things, you need to refactor your code to break up a big function into several smaller ones if you want to use this uh, mechanism. And we all know why we want to use D-Trace, um, so I'll skip over that. Uh, back in 2008, at the Erlang User Conference in Stockholm, uh, Gary Bulmer uh, made a presentation. The initial probes were added to uh, release uh, 12 of the Erlang virtual machine, and it also included a, a driver to allow Erlang code to, to uh, uh, to uh, create, uh, uh, to f uh, trigger probes also. So uh, Bulmer and his, uh, his, uh, uh, and his uh, partner Becker passed this project on to Ericsson and it got lost in the Ericsson hierarchy. Ericsson is sort of the uh, main sponsor uh, and supporter of, of uh, Erlang development uh, and they, they do a lot of really useful, uh, uh, really useful uh, uh, work and support uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, Joint does for Node.js, uh, for example. Um, but in their bureaucracy and in their internal uh, internal um, uh, their uh, internal projects, this particular feature got blocked. <coughs> so um, we come to last year, Basho for various React reasons. We need uh, this sort of thing. Dustin Sollings at uh, Couchbase um, uh, needs uh, uh, greater visibility into his application. Erlang Solutions for RabbitMQ and other Erlang apps that they support uh, needs this stuff. 
And then there's also uh, this thing um, that uh, started uh, at the end of last year called the Release Project, which is, uh, uh, it's not EUC funded, it's a, a EU, the European Union funded uh, multi-year project to scale uh, uh, Erlang, uh, both a single VM and clusters of virtual machines to tens of thousands of cores. And so they need much greater visibility into what's happening than er the Erlang virtual machine uh, also. So all of these things come into uh, creating uh, work where I had taken uh, work that uh, Dustin had uh, started. Uh, I picked up Mihal Patacek from uh, Erlang Solutions, create the autoconf magic stealing from both uh, Python uh, and from uh, Berkeley DB to create the autoconf magic to get everything to work and then also uh, as a, uh, also get the system tap uh, compatibility layer mostly, uh, mostly behaving itself. So we have a little over 60 probes added to the virtual machine at this time uh, related to processes, spawn, exit, uh, hibernate, uh, whether or not the process is scheduled or, uh, or no longer runnable. Um, when messages are sent, queued, uh, received, uh, and then there's also exit signals. Um, if uh, you can monitor a process, um, and then when that process dies, you'll be guaranteed to get a message sent to you saying uh, that, the, that that process is dead and why it died. Um, for garbage collection, both major and minor uh, sleeps, uh, as well as when the process heap, because uh, Erlang, uh, the, message, uh, the memory model, uh, each process has its own heap, and which is really kind of cool in that you don't have a, you don't have to do a stop the world uh, garbage collection because uh, uh, you, you can instead garbage collect uh, individual process heaps, which are typically much smaller. Um, and so, um, uh, as garbage collection then happens, you can you can get reports on whether the uh, single process uh, uh, heap has shrunk uh, or grown as a result of DC. Uh, data copying both uh, within a heap for garbage collection or for uh, uh, operations that are happening within your code, as well as uh, data copying across heaps, which is typically uh, related to uh, message passing. Uh, for message passing, the data is copied from, uh, in most cases, uh, from uh, one from the sender's uh, processes heap to the receiver's heap. Uh, function calls for Erlang functions and BIFs, which are um, they appear like Erlang functions, but they're actually implemented in C. And then NIFs are. Uh, a uh, variation of that, but th that's typically code that's loaded in from a, a shared library uh, of, of one sort or another. Network distribution. So uh, Erlang nodes um, use TCP to uh, as a transport for uh, uh, carrying messages uh, uh, between nodes, and so we can we can monitor when those links go up and down, uh, when they're busy, so that the buffering uh, on the sender side the buffers get too full, um, and then uh, a bunch of uh, of uh, uh, ports and drivers which are interfaces to uh, to third-party code. Uh, there's a hell of a lot of stuff uh, left to do in terms of uh, dealing with uh, the SMP uh, scheduler, in terms of queue lengths and, and uh, uh, work stealing that's done uh, between uh, between uh, schedulers, uh, various locking uh, events, uh, the entire uh, TCP, UDP, and SCTP uh, sort of combo stack um, could use uh, an awful lot of, of, uh, of uh, probe love and uh, uh, various uh, other stuff. Um, and so here's some examples. Um, uh, Erlang terms, um, what do we have here? So uh, the, this e term, the, the first argument to object copy um, is a 32 or 64 bit number and it's a, it's a, it's a tagged uh, thing and these, these, uh, the two tag bits then uh, are interpreted to be uh, 10 or 11 different uh, Erlang data types, uh, fundamental uh, uh, data types. Um, but it's too difficult to, to create the D magic to, to within D itself to decode what these terms are. Is it an atom? Is this a float? Or is it an integer? Or a big num? Or you know, all those other things. So um, we use this, uh, this function, the ERTS as printf, to just convert the term to a string and then pass that string into the probe. Um, and so a lot of the probes are one-liners, or, or would be one-liners if it weren't for this conversion of what the hell to do with these data things to to give the, the human or whatever is consuming the, 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 the D probe firings uh, something meaningful. Um, and the easiest thing was just to convert it to a string and we'll deal with making that more uh, user friendly uh, sometime later. Um, tracking births and deaths, this is something that you can do with an uh, instrumented uh, special uh, compilation build of the virtual machine. This just uh, every one second would, would tell you how many uh, processes were, were spawned and how many were exited, uh, how many had exited. Um, Dustin came up with this uh, with this script. Uh, what's the latency between sending a message and the pro and the receiver being scheduled to run? Uh, this kind of latency thing is really kind of cool. Um, it's very to, uh, easy to do with um, 
uh, you know, a short descript, um, and then uh, you could get uh, you know, a histogram like this. This was a completely idle machine. The power saving screws up the, the, the CPU frequencies and, and whatever else, but we're looking at uh, 16 microseconds for, for uh, just uh, uh, for the, that latency from the send to the, the receiver being scheduled to run. Uh, and then, um, uh, like looking at things like function calls that start on one CPU and function call, Erlang function call returns on another CPU. Uh, and again, it's pretty straightforward to do in, uh, uh, in D. And here's an example, just typing stuff at the shell. Erl val is a, is a, is a REPL shell uh, related thing. Um, and it stacked up before we hopped from CPU four to two and then from two to six. Um, and this, this happens all the time uh, within the, the virtual machine, whether it's idle or busy. Um, uh, this is a, a message path for a file rename operation. So uh, Erlang was uh, originally designed to operate in, in, in sort of embedded and, and very controlled environments. Uh, and so the, the node that, or the, the machine that might be running Erlang might not have a local file system, might have no disk. And so to operate in diskless mode, a, a, a user process um, executing the rename function might have that request sent off to another node that actually has disk and, and a file system. And then from there, it makes a, a, a function call uh, that triggers uh, uh, work in a scheduler thread. We're now in the C side of the world on the, on the right-hand side. And then uh, to avoid blocking uh, the scheduler, uh, there's, a, there's a separate pool of, of, uh, of uh, pthreads that only do uh, potentially blocking file I.O. within the local file system. So that's the, the far right thread. And then when that work is finally done, then things propagate uh, back the other way. Uh, one of the things that was done was uh, allow the user process, or the, the Erlang process, to, uh, to tag, uh, to create a, 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 a process attribute, uh, it's a tag, which can be an arbitrary string, of, I think, up to uh, a couple hundred bytes. Um, and then that tag would be propagated all the way down to the, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, D probe that fires in C code in that asynchronous uh, operating thread all on the far side. So if you set it to, uh, you know, uh, I'm doing this for Bob over on the Erlang side of the world, then your, your probe firing will have that same string, I'm doing this for Bob, uh, when the probe fires. Um, and then um, uh, our, our, uh, uh, to, to be able to fire probes from arbitrary uh, Erlang code, we, don't, we haven't used the, the, the uh, method that's used in uh, Node.js uh, yet. Uh, when when the, the, the lib USDT thing uh, is finished, uh, we'd be more than happy to use that. So at the moment, we have this deal where you can, fire, you can provide up to four integers and up to uh, four strings. So uh, we go up to eight instead of six, no JS, maybe it works better, maybe not. But, um, uh, and then the, the function will return true or false depending on whether or not that probe is actually uh, 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 enabled at the time. And so uh, the past and future, so these probes really aren't enough in terms of the 60. We don't have a stack support somehow. I, I worked for a day and a half on that and my brain just turned to goo. Uh, and then uh, the libusdt stuff, and then also having a lot of, uh, of uh, more examples in, uh, bundled along the, in the distribution. We've got uh, about a dozen of them that at least show how each of the probes can be, can be used, but they're, they're pretty kind of contrived examples, a lot of them. Um, so as of this week, and it may have been even today, that uh, R15, the release R15, uh, first uh, maintenance release, or minor version, um, which should be released this week, um, in my uh, GitHub repo, we have uh, dtrace for R14 V04 if you had a particular hack that, that couldn't yet use the R15 version. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Basho for allowing me a lot of work time to, to sort of be the shepherd to take Dustin's work and, and the halls and sort of get it through the Ericsson uh, QA process. And uh, with that, uh, I got a whole bunch of, of extra crap that I had no time, so uh, whatever questions you have is fine. Um, yes. Uh, and so, and, and have they actually been used to solve spawning the scripts are great, the script are great. Have you actually found some real problems with this? Brendan, have we found actual problems with this? <laughs> yeah, like so many have forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So like one of the things is uh, the, the libumem memory leak. Right, yeah. Was that we could then, uh, the, um, the, the uh, SmartOS uh, libumem had a memory leak that for workloads that we had for Linux customers, uh, which just memory usage for the virtual machine would, would, would remain flat. And under SmartOS would just continue growing uh, without bound, like what the hell is happening. And uh, so we were able to, to uh, 
to instrument the code so that um, we could look at events where we could figure we could see what Erlang function was executing when there was a memory allocation that then triggered an MMAP call for more than four megabytes or eight megabytes, and that was that was part of the memory leak. Um, so then we were uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't enough to find the problem, but it was enough to be able to find Erlang code that we could trigger the problem much more frequently. And then a lot of, of, of digging by by Brendan to actually find the. The, the fault where like a, a map was failing for some reason the first time it was done a second time and I forget the details but yeah. Interesting. Matt Rani asked us to heckle you that their application is written in JavaScript not in Java. <laughs> I'm sorry I misspoke. Yes, it, it is most certainly in JavaScript and Node.js and particularly I.O. You said that but you spelled it without the script part of the end. So I think you just ran out of slide space. <laughs> oh, okay. It's right. It was a screen problem. Yeah, it was display problem. <laughs> Thank you. tuned in for the screencast just to see that. Well, I mean, you know, being in Hawaii, I would definitely stay in Hawaii and, and, and listen in if I could do so, too. <laughs> so the one thing that I had that was uh, sort of related, there, there, was, there was a talk about here about um, adoption and, and issues like that. Is the, the example that Scott gave that I had that was the, uh, the latency for message send, um, that was really my response to an assertion that you can't know this information inside of Erlang. So I just, you know, typed on the camera and said, yes, this is the stuff you can't know. <laughs> what, what that caused was not so much a solution, but an assertion shift. So um, you really got to the point of like, well, I can't know this now. And, you know, it, it's, it's back to the adoption problem of saying, what if you could know everything and then accepted that you could know everything and then worked with the knowledge that you had and not so much um, just, wanting to be right again, you know, something else, because, you know, like you are. So I think part of the, uh, the, the conversation around um, getting people to, you know, pass the barriers to entry would be really interesting. Yeah, at Basho, we don't have too many political problems in that, you know, performance of, 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 of application X sucks, so let's rewrite it and see. Um, but other shops definitely do. And so to, to gain the, vis the visibility and, and say that, you know, We've, we've got data to show that, that this is not an Erlang problem. It's, it's in code that we're calling through a driver or something like that, or if it's network latency, talking to some other app elsewhere in the net. That helps a great deal. That's great. Um, so I, I, I definitely want to, uh, obviously I have more discussion because I want to get to the Linux guys, so the Linux guys, because they kind of split. But Scott, Certainly. Great. Thank you. Very Thank much. you for your time.